Uh, it's great to see such a large crowd here. The resistance is live and well and up early today. For those of you, uh, you know, who were watching last night, welcome to the first day of the Capitals owning the Stanley Cup. I'm from Pittsburgh. I'm from Pittsburgh. Yeah. We'll let the Penguins fans have their say later on. Um, I'm Ron Klain. I'm a lawyer here in Washington, a member of the ACS Board of Advisors, and I'm very glad to be uh, moderating this panel today. Before we get started, I have a few announcements. Please silence your cell phones, but do not turn them off because we want to make sure you tweet, post, gram, snap about this exciting panel with the hashtag ACS2018. Uh, if you're looking for a CLE credit, make sure your badge was scanned on your way into the room. Uh, and finally, if you have questions, there are cards on the tables. Please write them down. Someone will be around and collect them. We'll leave some time at the end for your uh, questions, OK? So a few thoughts to start off that I'll introduce our panel. Uh, we uh, have a Republican president, a president who is a uh, kind of a would-be self-styled autocrat, uh, about whom one member of his own party recently said that he governs as if he had only a passing familiarity with the Constitution. And that may be generous. We have a Congress that's rapacious in rolling back legal rights and kind of supine and safeguarding against presidential overreach. And as a result, uh, the fate of our rights, the state of the law, the fate of the rule of law rests in the hands of the judiciary more than ever before. But those courts are under a withering assault. Uh, assaults against the third branch have been part of our history as long as we've been a country. But today, those assaults are backed by well-heeled special interests, well-funded uh, political groups using the latest in political technologies and the no-holds-barred, winner-take-all tactics of our uh, political culture. Uh, so the thin line, the judiciary, the third branch, the thin line that stands between us and constitutional catastrophe is tested like ever be, never before, under assault like never before. How much danger do our courts face? And most importantly, what can we do to defend them? That's the questions we're going to ask today with this incredibly distinguished panel, which I will now introduce briefly. Their full bios are in your packets, so I'm not going to do them justice here, but just quickly introduce them in alphabetical order, which is helpfully not the order on which they are seated here on the stage. Uh, so uh, at the very far end, uh, Professor Tom Ginsburg of the University of Chicago. Professor Ginsburg focuses on comparative and international law from an interdisciplinary perspective. He is an award-winning author and scholar and is the author of a fantastic article from last year, How to Lose a Constitutional <coughs> Democracy, although today we'd like some advice on how to keep it, if you don't mind. Uh, Gina Green, uh, two seats to my left is the Managing Dem Director of Democracy Collaborative at Rethink Media, a communication shop focused on powering movements by strengthening the communications impact of those movements and the groups within them. Uh, she is an alum of the University of South Carolina. Uh, Chris Kang, next to Gina, uh, uh, was a colleague of mine in the Obama White House, a Deputy White House Counsel in charge of judicial selection, uh, worked on the selection, vetting selection, confirmation of more than 220 of the most talented and diverse federal judges in American history. And recently, uh, Chris helped found and launch a new organization called Demand Justice, which we'll be hearing about today. Uh, Melissa Crom, who's right next to me, is the director of North Carolina Voters for Clean Elections, a coalition with more than 35 organizations. Uh, they played a key role in trying to protect public financing for judges in North Carolina and in successfully fighting back an effort to uh, uh, take back the way in which judges down there are appointed and to pack the North Carolina Supreme Court. Uh, she received her BA from North Carolina State. Um, really pleased to be joined by former Judge Tim Lewis. Uh, judge Lewis uh, is the co-chair of Schneider, Harrison, Siegel, and Lewis, uh, where he works as a mediator, arbitrator, and a practitioner. Uh, uh, I'm sure everyone in this room knows he was a former a prosecutor, a district court judge, and then a judge on the Third Circuit Court of Appeals. He is also a member of the Board of Directors of ACS. Uh, Christine Lucius, kind of right there in the middle, is now the Executive Vice President for Policy at the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights, having previously spent 14 years working uh, for Senator Pat Leahy on the Judiciary Committee staff as his top legal and policy advisor. She also worked in private practice in the Justice Department, and she is a graduate of the Georgetown University Law Center. So with those introductions, I just want to get started. Um, kind of with this question, uh, uh, how much trouble are the courts in today 
what sorts of threats to the independence of the judiciary do we face, both here in Washington and around the country? And Chris, maybe you could kick us off with that from your perspective and also what demand justice is all about. Sure. Uh, I don't want to be overly dramatic, but maybe appropriately dramatic, that you know, I think we're in the middle of a pitched fight for the future of our country uh, between ordinary citizens and the powerful, the wealthy, and the elite. And the challenge we face now is that the powerful and the wealthy in these corporations don't believe that the rules apply to them. And if you look at the big picture in our democracy, you see it with Citizens United, where corporate money is drowning out ordinary citizens' votes, voices. You see it with Shelby County, where our, votes, where our votes don't count, or we're not allowed to go to the ballot. And then you see it in partisan gerrymandering, where we, even when we're able to vote, our votes count less because of the way that they're structured. And it's the same mentality that the rules don't apply that they are bringing to the courts now. We have seen, thankfully so far, we have seen the courts step in and act as a check and balance to a number of President Trump's most offensive policies, from the most extreme Muslim ban, to trying to stop DACA, to trying to defund sanctuary cities, to trying to ban transgender people from serving our country and our military, to repealing clean air and clean water, to uh, limiting access to abortion for unaccompanied minors, to to uh, funding for teen pregnancy, time and time and time again, we have seen our courts step in and act as a check and balance that our country, that our Congress will not. And this is the way that our government and our democracy is supposed to work. But again, the challenge here is that the powerful and the wealthy, these corporations and elites, don't think the rules should apply to them. They don't want checks and balances. They want to put their thumbs on the scale of justice, and they want to change our judiciary. They want to pack these courts with as many ideological, narrow-minded extremists as they can. And I know that this idea of packing the courts is sometimes I say that and people say that's controversial. We're not packing the courts. Packing the courts is when you enlarge it and stuff your judges in. I will say this, that when this Republican Senate in 2015 and 16 confirmed only 22 of President Obama's judges, the fewest since President Truman, when they confirmed only two circuit court judges in two years, the fewest since the 1800s, so that they could now already confirm 21 of President Trump's circuit court judges, that is packing the courts. That is trying to fundamentally shift our third branch in a way that we've never seen before. And how are they doing it? Again, they don't think that the rules apply to them. They're changing the rules. We saw it in the Supreme Court most dramatically, where for the first time since Supreme Court nominees have been given hearings, the Republican Senate, uh, the Republican Senate refused to give Chief Judge Merrick Garland even a hearing. Then we saw them again take their, their dark money, $17 million, in order to help make the case for Justice Gorsuch. And then, when that didn't work, a Democratic senator stood up and said no. They changed the threshold so that Justice Gorsuch could be confirmed with a simple majority, and we've already seen what he's done on this court. They're changing the rules from the Supreme Court to the lower courts. We can get into all of the details, all of the small ways that they're changing the committee process, the Senate consideration from a 100-year tradition to the, like the blue slips, to something much more small but incredibly significant, like allowing two circuit judges on a hearing at the same time so that they can continue to pack the courts more quickly. Our courts really are under assault, and I don't think that that's an understatement. And I think the biggest challenge we have now is when these powerful, wealthy elitists are moving from thinking the rules don't apply to them to thinking that the rule of law does not apply to them. And this is why we need to defend our third branch. Right. Thank you, Chris. Uh, you know, what Chris is talking about has gotten a lot of attention, but it's not just happening in terms of the federal courts and the federal bench, but also the state judiciary. And Melissa, maybe you could talk about some of your experiences on the front lines here in North Carolina. Yes. Um, so I'm looking at how the state courts are under attack in North Carolina. Um, the first we saw was the repeal of judicial public financing in 2013, because we were looking at ways to inject partisan politics and big money into the judicial system by that repeal. Um, soon after that, um, the 2014 judicial election played out where, um, and I'm, let me pause here, and I'm gonna have to explain some of this um, in partisan ways, because that's how our legislature thinks, but I want to say that you know judges, they don't wear red robes, they don't wear blue robes, 
They wear black robes because they are there to uphold the law, not dive into partisan politics. So at the end of the 2014 election, we saw the majority on the Supreme Court um, shift to three Democrats and four Republicans, with a Republican up in 2016, 2018, and 2020. So suddenly it became um, incredibly vital uh, uh, for the legislature to start um, injecting into our, uh, our courts. So we saw an attempt to pass retention elections of judges um, to basically take away the option of an election in 2016 and only allow the incumbent to be voted up or down. If he was voted down, um, the uh, governor, who was a, rep a Republican at that time, would be able to appoint his replacement. The thing is, in North Carolina, um, we have the right, the constitutional right, to elect our judges. This was ingrained into our Reconstruction Era Constitution because we did have like a legislative appointment of judges in the colonial period of our time. But then the Civil War happened, and we were forced to rewrite our Constitution for good measure. And in that rewrite, we were given the right constitutional right to vote for our judges. So um, the retention of election of judges was overturned. And in the 2016 election, uh, Ju Justice uh, Mike Morgan was elected. And with that election, now the Democrats have a majority on the Supreme Court through the 2022 election. So think about that. That's redistricting law, uh, legislative redistricting lawsuits. So suddenly, after the 2016 election, we started to hear about court packing how uh, the legislature was going to quickly come in and appoint uh, two justices and allow the outgoing Republican governor, um, Pat McCroy, to appoint those justices. Well, we defeated that. We pushed back. And, yeah. So after that, um, we saw attempts to make all judges partisan. We had nonpartisan judicial elections in North Carolina. We became the first state in 100 years to go from nonpartisan judicial elections to partisan judicial elections. Then we saw an attempt to reduce the seats on the Court of Appeals because we didn't like it that a Democratic governor could appoint those replacements. So um, we eliminated three seats in the Court of Appeals. The governor vetoed it. And over the weekend um, that the governor uh, vetoed it, a Republican judge named Douglas McCullough on the Court of Appeals resigned in protest so that the governor could appoint, quickly appoint his replacement before they could override the veto so we could still maintain a fully functioning Court of Appeals. Then um, we saw judicial redistricting. We saw an attempt to uh, redistrict our local and trial court judges. Um, we have put a hold on that for right now. Um, that is uh, now pared down to just a few counties. Um, and then we saw proposed constitutional amendments to move from um, eight-year judicial terms to two-year judicial terms. That's on ice for a, the moment. <laughs> and we saw an attempt to move um, a proposed constitutional amendment to eliminate the election of judges and instead have a legislative appointment of judges because we the people, I guess, we're not choosing the right judges, so the legislature wanted to start choosing our judges for us. Again, we have defeated many of these proposals, and we're going to keep fighting. Excellent. Well, I'm glad you are, Melissa. <laughs> Judge Lewis, um, I'm curious on your perspective on this from a historical standpoint as a former member of the federal bench and also now someone who lives in Pennsylvania. I, when I grew up in the Midwest, you could still see billboards that said impeach Earl Warren wherever you drove around <laughs> when I was a young kid. And now in Pennsylvania, uh, the state courts have ruled on districting. There was an effort to impeach members of the courts. What are you seeing there from both your, with both your federal hat and your Pennsylvania hat on? Well, thank you very much, Ron. Um, you know, most of my focus over the past couple of years has been on um, the federal courts and um, particularly the Merrick Garland hearing or non-hearing. Um, and it's, it's only, I think, within the past maybe 12 months or so, that we have seen what I consider to be a direct assault on the independence of the judiciary at the state court level um, percolating throughout, throughout the country. Um, I don't know whether it was James Carville or someone who came up with the expression about my home state of Pennsylvania that you have Pittsburgh and Philadelphia and Mississippi in between or whatever, <laughs> like Alabama, I don't know. And I'm not even sure how accurate that is, but uh, I'm from Pittsburgh. Um, and um, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court um, 
is an elected appellate judiciary, politics continues to play a role. Um, in January, the Supreme Court issued a decision that the um, 2011 congressional uh, map had been exceptionally gerrymandered and was unconstitutional. It violated the Pennsylvania state constitution. And in the wake of that decision, some Republican um, legislators uh, were so deeply offended and threatened that um, they refused to comply with a mandate of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. I think, I think it was Joseph Scarnati was the gentleman's name who was the president pro tem of the state senate who was ordered to turn over certain information and data so that the court could um, redraw the, the maps because they had refused to, the, the legislature had refused to, re, to do so. And he said, well, I'm not going to turn it over because I consider this order to be unconstitutional. This went to the United States Supreme Court. The Supreme Court um, declined to hear the case. And still, and still, he said, well, I still consider this to be unconstitutional. And I'm, I'm not going to comply. Um, on the heels of that, a gentleman by the name of Chris Dush, who is a state representative from Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania, who had previously been known only for giving a speech to a group of high school students in which he said that the reason for tens of thousands of deaths in Haiti in the wake of a hurricane was because they were still practicing Santeria or voodoo or something like that there. They were not a Christian country. Um, this is what he was known for before. Now he decides to really make a name for himself by introducing an impeachment resolution to impeach the four justices in the majority of the um, gerrymandering opinion. Now, this is a very, very serious matter. You know, in Kansas, um, there was an effort to do something similar. There was an effort to revise the impeachment of justices language to say something like, um, if you basically offend the legislature or do not comport yourself in your judicial office appropriately, something loose and vague that will, would allow for whatever the legislature deems offensive or inappropriate to be the grounds for impeachment. In Pennsylvania, the standard is um, misbehavior. And of course, the legislature can decide whatever, whatever that is. Um, this is. This is a very serious, there are many ways to assault the independence of the judiciary. But this one is a very, very direct and serious effort. So what, um, what happened is that uh, eventually the uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Pennsylvania Supreme Court, issued a statement saying that any effort to impeach because of judicial decision making is a, an assault on the independence of the judiciary and is inappropriate. And some, and he, he's a Republican, a staunch Republican who was in the dissent in the gerrymandering opinion. And so some of the senators, the 12 members of the Senate who were um, advancing this effort um, stood down, but it's still alive. I mean, it has not yet been withdrawn. The resolution is still alive. I think that um, this really starts at the top. When you have a president who consistently undermines the rule of law, consistently attacks uh, in, in individual judges um, because of their, their race or their ethnic heritage, um, because of a disagreement in how a decision was made, repeatedly attacks the Department of Justice and our institutions. You have a diminution um, in values and respect and regard for traditions and um, some, of the, some of the things that Chris Kang was talking about that are revered. Um, and that allow us to continue to be who we are. And I think this trickles down and empowers people to take these kinds of actions and to make these kinds of threats. So we'll see what happens and how it unfolds in Pennsylvania. As I said, it has not yet been withdrawn. But this is, you know, we had a session yesterday of uh, former uh, judges and current judges, and uh, we we're talking about some of the things that are affecting the independence of the judiciary. And it was pointed out that the business of this country in terms of judging and lawyering really does happen at the state court level for the most part. And that is really where we have to continue to, to invest some resources in monitoring and doing everything that we can to ensure 
that judges are protected and that the judiciary continues to be the bulwark of independence that it was intended to be and that it must remain. So, Thank think, you, Judge. Yes. So uh, we've heard a little bit now about the threat to the federal courts, the threat to state courts. I want to uh, move to the question of the context in which this all occurs. And Professor Ginsburg, uh, from your work, your research, your writings, uh, what about what we're seeing reflects uh, retrogression against the rule of law and uh, some kind of unwinding with the public or the country as a whole on these norms and values? Great. Thanks, Ron. Uh, yeah, so much of my work in this area is comparative, uh, and I've, I've been working on a book. It'll be out in a couple months, which the title you'll like. It's called How to Save a Constitutional Democracy. Try to figure Thank out the, you. Other, Thank you very much. the other end of it. And one of the, th one of the themes, of course, is that, um, you know, in the United States, we like to talk about American exceptionalism. We're different. We're outside the scope of history. What happens in other countries doesn't apply to us. And one of the things we're learning in the current wave of democratic erosion around the world is that uh, strategies can be borrowed from country to country just as they can be borrowed from state to state uh, and that the United States has no reason to think that we're immune from these various forces that are at work around the world. Um, in thinking about the threats to democracy, comparative constitutional lawyers like me um, in some ways have, um, haven't had sufficient imagination uh, much of the thinking in this area thinks of the threat to democracy as being essentially what happened in World War II and the communists sort of collapses. A quick sudden end to democracy through a coup uh, or uh, you know, a revolution or some such thing. In fact, when you look around the world today, what we're seeing is a much more subtle process, the process of constitutional and democratic erosion, uh, where step by step, with each individual step being perhaps legal, perhaps you know, not such a big deal. We see the gradual uh, ending of democracy or through a series of, of individual actions that might take something like 20 years. Um, so it took 20 years from Hugo Chavez's election in Venezuela until what I'd say was the end of democracy there last year. Uh, Viktor Orban in Hungary is doing many of the same things and uh, of course Erdogan in Turkey, et cetera. Now this learning I think has a lot of relevance to us. Because one of the things about the new authoritarianism uh, or illiberal democracy, whatever word you want to put uh, on it, is that it is legal. That is, it's legal in form. The judges are at the very center of the regimes of repression. Um, and that means capturing the judiciary becomes really important. Uh, and so some of the techniques that we've observed around the world, I think, are relevant to the United States. And they do involve, uh, um, you know, some. If, if the judges are resisting, then you have to mobilize against them, you reduce jurisdiction, you uh, do your best to pack the courts, you pass statutes that undermine all previous jurisprudence of the Constitutional Court, as was done in Hungary. Um, once you are able to capture the judges, they become an instrument, of course, of facilitating the rest of the developments in the regime and the other realms which matter so much, the bureaucracy, the elections, the media, et cetera. So judges are really crucial as bulwarks against erosion and potentially as instruments of erosion. Well, thank you, Tom. Gina, when you engage the public on these topics, what are you hearing and what do you think can be done to more effectively engage the public on the kinds of things we've been talking about? Well, the short answer, I think, is that a lot because what we're seeing in research that's been conducted as well as in media advocacy is three main things. One. And the public gets the idea of this notion of a three-legged stool, which is that the courts and the judiciary sit in a unique spot with the legislative branch and with the executive branch, and they occupy an apolitical, independent space, and they have a real role to play. So that is good. And we don't know if the public knows that because they've watched Schoolhouse Rock or if it's law and order or what have you, but they have this general sense that this is the role the court should play. Now what that means is, is they also, that's, that sense is very general and it's very vague and they don't really know how the courts work, they don't really know how judges are selected, they don't really know what it means for the judiciary to be independent. And so that means there's this blank canvas that advo that's both a challenge and an opportunity for us. So it means that this blank canvas is something that we as advocates can project onto our messages, our ideals, our values, but it also means that the opposition can do the same thing. So that's a challenge and an opportunity for us. Two, the public, even the ones who think they know a lot, are still low information. They don't know enough. They don't know all the details, which means that in any opportunity that we have, whether it's a defensive opportunity, 
opportunity um, in North Carolina, or if it's an offensive opportunity to do, to, to do judicial reform in another state, we still have to have public education be a fundamental component of public engagement, because there's a lot to explain and a lot to tell the public about these issues. Also, the public is generally with us on these issues. You see in North Carolina and Pennsylvania, they get that the judiciary is there to protect our rights, protect the Constitution, and it does seem above beyond the pale when legislators step over the line in these states. And so that is another advantage that we have at our disposal. And we absolutely do need to harness the media in this work. And I would you know, applaud the work that Melissa has done in North Carolina, um, also Kadita in Pennsylvania. I see you in the audience there with uh, Why Courts Matter PA. This work is extremely important because of all of the room that we have to influence the public and really get them involved in these issues. And Christine, from the perspective of LCCR and, and leadership uh, among uh, organizations that care about these issues, what can be done, what more can be done to try to defend the third branch from these kinds of attacks and to try to bring leaders to, the, to, this, to this fight? So at the leadership conference, we represent more than 200 national organizations, many of which are the major civil rights litigators um, for the last several decades. And what I find in talking to those leaders is the focus on litigation, because there were so many important litigation victories last year that stopped uh, really offensive policies and, and attacks on civil rights. <clears throat> but I like, <clears throat> excuse me, but I like to think of the courts if you only focus on the litigation, it's like buying new brakes when your tires are totally bald. And so you have to protect both. The litigation and the important victories in court are only going to last so long if the courts are taken over by people who are affirmatively coming to the court with an agenda to roll back civil rights. And what I would say in terms of leadership conference, what we're hearing, what we're hearing is litigators, civil rights litigators and civil rights leaders starting to really understand that. that they cannot take the independence of the courts for granted. And especially in the federal courts, as Chris indicated, there is a clear plan that this president has. And he is completely being helped and, and aided with that plan by Chairman Grassley and by Mitch McConnell. And they're not thinking about their own institutional power. They are just thinking about taking over these courts. But we should all pay attention, and, and the civil rights leaders that I speak to are all paying attention to what they're trying to do. Chris made an important point about protecting the privilege and, and, the, and corporations, but I think they're also coming, nominees to the federal bench are coming to the nominations process. They are being selected because of their biased record, because of their pro-corporate uh, records. And that should really frighten us all. This president has bragged multiple times about his multiple litmus tests, the type of bias we are seeing um, against LGBTQ people <coughs> as one example is really stunning. And it's not necessarily something that, that you can't find from a simple Google search. This isn't like a failure of vetting. I've come to believe it's, a, it's not a bug, it's a feature. That is why they're getting selected, because they have this known bias in their agenda. And I think that has made us able to make the case more to leaders from all corners of the civil rights community about why the courts matter. I think people have been shocked when they just even read some of the comments that these nominees have made, whether it's about transgender children being part of Satan's plan, or whether it is saying that a judge who uh, is gay can't be impartial in a, in a gay marriage case. So I think one, once more people hear like the direct quotes from these nominees and see the bias they're coming to this uh, process with, I think it really makes people wake up to what is really going on. It's both the math that Chris mentioned, but it's also the type of records they are being selected for to advance in a more powerful position on the courts. That's great, thanks. Uh, before we go on, just want to do a quick poll to see uh, if uh, this audience can answer questions that have stumped recent judicial nominees. Who here thinks that Brown versus Board was rightly decided? <laughs> Show of hands. Awesome. That's great. See how easy that is? It's so simple. I don't know why it's so hard. I don't know why people find that so hard. Um, I think that's a great overview of the situation. I want to take a few minutes and kind of bifurcate this for a second into the difference between the federal courts and the state courts and start with the federal courts. And, for both you, Chris, and Christine, who've been so involved in this process over the past decade, how do you answer critics who say, look, this is really just the shoe on the other foot. 
When the Democrats were in charge, we got rid of the filibuster. We tried to jam as many judges through as we could. We succeeded. We failed. But, you know, now just basically the Republicans in charge, they're just doing the same thing we were doing. Is it, is it more than that? Why is it more than that? And Chris, why don't you start and then Christine follow yeah, I, up. I think that my response is, is to stop being so lazy in thinking about this mm -hmm. argument, right? Like, there's a lot of great journalism and punditry. There's a lot of really bad journalism and punditry, right? There's, we just lived through an election which really showed what false equivalency can look like, sort of this both sides journalism, and you see it here in the courts and this idea, and quite honestly, I think we let ourselves sometimes because, well, didn't we do the same thing? And we sort of try to give the other side more credit than they're due. And what happened here, and in particular, I just want to focus on the nuclear option in 2013, because that is what Republicans point to and say, Repu Democrats did this in 2013, so it's okay we did this for Neil Gorsuch, it's okay that we're doing this to pack the courts now. And just to take a half a step back, in 2013, Republicans were filibustering nominees because they opposed the institutions, not the nominees themselves. They opposed the CFPB so they would not confirm Richard Cordray. They confirmed the idea of an ATF so they would not confirm Todd Jones. They opposed the idea of the NLRB so they would not confirm commissioners. And they opposed the idea of a DC circuit that might actually have some Democratic judges on it. So they filibustered three nominees just for the institution. Nobody said a single negative thing, critical thing, about Patty Millett. Nobody said a single critical thing about Judge Robert Wilkins. Some people said some critical things about <laughs> Nina Piller. <laughs> Turns out that when you fight for justice and equality, you might make some people mad. But these three impeccably qualified men and women for the DC Circuit were being filibustered because they didn't want to change the institution. And that was what made it so different. That is why Democrats had no choice. If you're not even going to argue this on the merits, and you're going to filibuster anybody who comes forward, of course Democrats have to respond. You're not even giving them a choice. Fast forward to Justice Gorsuch's confirmation. Nobody said, we're going to filibuster anybody that President Trump nominates. They said, we're filibustering this person, because this person is a narrow-minded elitist with a record of putting corporations and special interests above ordinary Americans, and he does not and cannot understand the impact of the law on all Americans. That is why we oppose him. It's completely different when you're talking about the merits of a person versus the entire institution. So this idea, this both sides, like Democrats did it so it's okay, is completely false, it's unfair, and it's lazy. The other thing I'll note here, as we talk about norms and traditions being eroded, the blue slips, I don't want to really get into the Senate history here, but, the, but I will. Um, <laughs> for 100 years, it has been the practice of the Senate that for a judicial nominee to move forward, you have to have the support of both home state senators. And we saw, just by way of example, for the third time, Republicans have moved forward a nominee without the support of both of their home state, home state senators. This just happened yesterday. And Senator Feinstein's office put out a tweet yesterday saying, this is unprecedented that nominees move forward with zero blue slips. Both Senators Merkley and Wyden from Oregon uh, oppose this nomination of Ryan Bounds from Oregon, Oregon and Senator Feinstein's tweet said this has never happened before. And the response from Senator Grassley's staff was, well, actually, we did this in 2003, too. And so one, technically the tweet was wrong from Senator Feinstein. What has never happened before is a judge has never been confirmed with no blue slips, with both home state senators uh, objecting. But think about that response. Think about the defense by Republican senators was, no, no, we screwed you before too, don't you remember? So it's okay that we're screwing you again now. Right? In the history, 100 year history of the blue slips, no Democratic chairman of the Judiciary Committee has ever ever disregarded a Republican senator's objection. Senator Grassley now is the third of the last four Republican chairmen to disregard a Democratic senator's objection. And this playing by two sets of rules is what has to change and what we have to demand the next time there's a Democratic president and a Democratic chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Christine? Can I yes, by the way, applause for that is completely appropriate. <laughs> Can 
I say that usually Chris and I are having these conversations and we wonder if anyone cares and I'm so heartened to see how many people are in this room and to the people standing in the back, there are seats up front. Come on up, you can sit. Uh, so thank you everyone for being here because sometimes Chris and I wonder you know, if, if it's getting out there and if people are interested. So we're really excited at the turnout today. Uh, I would say it's not tit for tat. I worked on, uh, I started on the committee during the Bush administration. Um, over those eight years, I think we filibustered about 12 people. I did research at the Justice Department during the Clinton administration where Orrin Hatch single-handedly stopped about 60 Clinton nominees um, just by bottling them up in committee, never giving Elena Kagan a hearing, for example, to the DC Circuit and clearly not giving her a vote in the committee either. So we can do the tit for tat, but what I really think is different about this is the president. As Judge Lewis said, this president attacks judges who disagree with him. He expects the people he nominates to be loyal to him. And I think that is the difference. I don't think you would have seen President Bush saying anything like this president says about judges. He considers them his judges. He does not believe in independence. That is something that he does not care about. He cannot point to the Constitution and how the three branches are different, like everyone in this room can. That the judicial branch is supposed to be apolitical in the federal system. So I think it rots from the top. Uh, and I think that it, it's really unfortunate that senators don't care about their own institutional power and, and are putting party over country in that way. But I don't think this is tit for tat because I think this is a steamroller. And I just think it is completely different than anything we've seen because of the president and because what he is using to decide who to nominate. And then the, and then the Republicans in the Senate are just completely enabling it and disarming themselves in terms of being consulted as well. So I don't think it's the tit for tat that we've seen in the Senate. I think it is qualitatively different because of the president and how the president views independence, which he doesn't believe in it. He attacks any institution that keep, holds him accountable, whether it is the press, whether it is judges, you know, whether, whether it is sexual assault victims, right? So anyone who will be independent from this president will get attacked by this president, and sadly, judges are, are no different. So before I go on to the state to grassroots, I do want to ask Judge Lewis, you are uh, something of a, of a neutral player in this. You're, you, you don't have the kind of uh, partisan activist background that myself or Chris or Christine have. So uh, with that neutra more neutrality, more perspective, do you think what we're seeing now is different? And if so, how and why is that worrisome? Vastly different. But I, I, would, I would simply say this, though. I think that the institutional norms, um, I, I, I agree, I, I would phrase it a little differently. I think that um, um, the, what we are seeing from this president has exacerbated the breakdown in institutional norms tremendously. But the breakdown really was on, on display fully when Merrick Garland was nominated to the Supreme Court and within, I think, actually before he was nominated, yeah. within two days or three days of Scalia's death, the Senate Majority Leader announced that this vacancy will not be filled, the people will decide in the next election, forgetting the fact that the people had already decided twice by electing Barack Obama, President of the United States. And um, so um, we have seen this institutional breakdown. It manifests itself in the blue slip issue that we've just talked about. It is uh, significantly exacerbated by what we see with this president. Uh, the litmus test stuff, Chris, you know, it has been there forever. When I was nominated to the United States Court of Appeals, I did not, actually when I was, my name was put forward, I did not want to leave the district court and go on the Court of Appeals. Someone said the other, yesterday in a meeting, the district court judgeship is the best job there is. And it is, it actually is. And I turned it down and Arlen Specter pushed it and said, I want you to at least go to the Justice Department and have a hearing or have a, a meeting. I walked into a meeting with a man named Roger Clapp, who was doing something in the Civil Rights Division at the Justice Department. And before I was in my chair, there had only been one African American nominated to a circuit court uh, during that administration, and it was Clarence Thomas to the DC Circuit. So now there, my name is there, and I guess he hadn't gotten the memo that I was black. And before I was in my chair, 
Roger Clapp said, oh, well, it's nice to meet you. Before we even start this interview, I need to have your answers to four different questions. What are your views on school desegregation, housing desegregation, affirmative action, and the problems of the inner city? And in that split second, I said, you know what, now I want this job. Now I want to go on the Court of Appeal. And, and, I, and that's exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened. But my point is that the litmus, my point is that that is exactly what happened. And, my, and, and, and I wouldn't answer his questions just by the way. So he said, well, let's try it this way. Who are some of your favorite authors? Who do you like to read? So I said, okay, you want to play that game. Shelby Steele, I like Shelby Steele. I've never, I've never read anything by Shelby Steele. And, okay, but, but so this, this, you know, this is, but my, my, I, the reason I raise that is that at that, this was 1992, I was nominated by a Republican president. I was, confer, I was uh, put forward uh, um, uh, by a Democratic controlled Senate Judiciary Committee uh, confirmed unanimously by a Democratic uh, Senate. And I, what has happened since 1992 is a disgrace. And it is all, it also, you speak about my neutrality, I'm not really as neutral as you might think, but when it comes to institutional norms and values, the question that I constantly bump up against is this. And Chris, it's, it, it speaks to some of what you've brought up. At what point do we subjugate our respect for values and our principles to the idea of winning and the goal of winning and, and, and or do we subjugate the goal of winning to our ideals and our appreciation of values and norms and respect? We are in a serious fight and I, I really don't know the answer to that question. It may be episodic, it may be we choose to fight here and do this, we invoke the, the um, nuclear option, um, we, I, I don't know the answer, but that to me is the fundamental question that we all have to confront over and over again, no matter what our ideology. We have to maintain our values and our respect for institutional norms, and, um, we, but we cannot lose the overall fight. That's my perspective. I'm so glad Mr. Clapp asked you those questions. Do you know Mr. Clapp? Uh, not really. A okay. little bit. Not <laughs> enough. Right. Not as much as I should. Okay. Well, by the way, just to, I'm sorry, but to close this, I, I gave a lecture in Philadelphia a couple years ago, the Higginbotham Lecture, in which I took the Chief Justice of the United States to task for saying that the way to end discrimination is to stop discriminating and talking about important programs to help advance the interests of people of color and others who have been historically discriminated against from getting education and so forth. And Roger Clapp wrote an article, uh, uh, he awarded me the William Brennan Award for the worst former judge in the history of the country, something like that. Well, and I, and I, I was grateful to receive that award. What an honor, what an honor. Yeah. So that's right, Roger well, Clapp. I do now want to uh, pivot to um, the, the question of kind of the grassroots and the state courts and, um, and ask Melissa and Gina and, and Tom, is engaging the public, is rallying public opinion a double-edged sword for us? Is there some risk that the public, I mean, I appreciate uh, Gina's point, public kind of on our side, but some risk in this era of populism and you know, enthusiasm by Trump's supporters that as we bring the public into this, we wind up with uh, an erosion of this anti-democratic uh, or non-democratic branch, erosion of the third branch. So how do we balance public activism with defending the third branch? Maybe Gina, maybe you could kick us off and then uh, let Melissa and Tom. Sure. Um, so I referenced earlier this notion that public engagement on these issues has to include public education. Right? We have to be able to explain to folks why the courts matter. And, I, and one thing that I want to lift up, and I know that uh, Melissa will talk a lot about how the work that has played out in North Carolina with specific communities and grassroots, is that we need to really be able to highlight the role of the courts in our lives. And, and that means delivering multiple messengers, multiple messages to multiple communities and really being able to make those connections and connect those dots for folks. Um, that's really important, and even though the research that we've seen shows that uh, folks from across the political spectrum, Republican, Democrat, and every place in between, are, are already with us. But I will say this, that they're not with us for political reasons or partisan reasons. They're with us for the rule of law reasons. They're with us because of schoolhouse rock. They're with us because this is how the system is supposed to work. So I do think there is some danger and there is some need to navigate that space really clearly. It was why 
Judge Lewis's op-ed in Pennsylvania was really important because we really wanted to be able to make the case that this is not a partisan issue, this is not a political issue, this is about how our country is supposed to run. Now, we also know that the courts are not always viewed as exactly what they should be, particularly in communities of color, particularly in black communities who have seen the courts do well and the courts not do well. Right, and so that is another piece that requires navigation and really making sure that we're clear about what happens. Um, last night I watched the end of Chris Rock's latest Netflix special. Has anybody seen it, Tambourine? Anybody watched it? At one point he says- By the way, this is the only room in America where more people know about blue slips than Chris Rock's <laughs> latest Netflix, Netflix special, okay? So it's a unique room, True. unique room, unique room. But check it out, especially the last quarter of it, because he says, he makes a point that he says, he talks about going through a divorce, and he says, you don't want to be a man in family court, and you don't want to be a black man in any court. And it's true, because there are certain experiences that people have with the courts, and in our navigation of how we talk about their importance, and their role, and their impact, that is certainly something that we need to be mindful of in our media work, in our communications work, and making sure that we can address those communities, those needs, with multiple messages, multiple messengers, and really involve them, involve the grassroots in a way that really connects to them. Great. Melissa? So um, when we go out and talk about this issue, we talk about it as protecting the institutions of our democracy. The courts, they should be a bipartisan issue. And many times, um, you just need to know where to look to find that bipartisanship. You know, we beat back court packing because we had rank and file Republican lawmakers stand up and say, no, you don't get to do this to our institutions of democracy. We had an outgoing Republican governor say, even if the legislature you know, creates those seats, I'm not gonna make those appointments. I'm not gonna taint my, uh, my governorship by doing this. So, you know, we created the, um, the Fair Courts North Carolina campaign this past year, and, you know, we took this to the streets. And, you know, we did town halls, press conferences, rallies, lobby days, all across the state of North Carolina, over 30 events. And, you know, we talked about protecting the institutions of democracy, and this had a real impact. Because by the time we got into committee hearings, when they were, we understood that they were going to be passing some of these laws this past January, we had a Republican lawmaker, Representative John Bluss from Greensboro, North Carolina, stand up and say, you know, I don't think, honestly, the public will accept it. And that's because we went and we did the public education. We went to the grassroots. You know, we started having these town halls and meetings, and more and more people started showing up. They got bigger and bigger. We got to Greensboro, North Carolina. 200 people shut up for a fair courts town hall in Greensboro, North Carolina. <laughs> what? <laughs> yes. And then you had lawmakers showing up in Charlotte. I couldn't even fit all the lawmakers on the stage. You know, and then we had judges come and speak up and speak out. And then we had young people come. You know when you have a wonky issue as wonky as judicial <laughs> redistricting <laughs> and young people start coming out, you know you're starting to win. And so that's what we did. We took, the, took, it, to, took it to the streets. Awesome. Tom, what do you think about all this? Yeah, uh, well, uh, no one has said this yet, but the bad news, of course, is there's been a massive increase in partisan spending in state judicial elections. And uh, every cycle, the money comes in uh, in greater and greater amounts. And that's, of course, a t tremendous danger. The good news is that um, we have a little bit of survey data about this, people's perceptions of state courts from uh, the National Center on State Courts. And so far, that doesn't seem to be having an effect on people's perception of partisanship. People basically think the state courts are, are fairly apolitical. And the same data, by the way, shows what Gina was referring to, which is you know, African Americans have a worse perception of the courts in general. But, so I think it's, it's good, reliable data. Um, the question is, what's going to be the trajectory as more and more money comes into these things? And that's why these programs, I think, are just so fantastically important. Right. I want to. Um you know, we're, we're a, a room full of lawyers. We often think about lawyers obviously playing a critical role in defending the third branch. But I want to ask just anyone on the stage who has thoughts about this, uh, what about other kinds of groups of people, the faith community, the media, the academy? Where are our allies in this effort to defend the third branch outside of the bar and activist lawyers? Who else should we bring into this conversation that may not be here at uh, the ACS convention? 
Melissa, you, you, you're, you're doing this every day. <laughs> yes, um, so faith community. I have found that faith community leaders are people on the ground and they know folks. So when we organized um, that fair court town hall in Greensboro, North Carolina, it was because Rabbi Fred Gutman helped me organize it that 200 people showed up. And he got up and spoke from a faith perspective about why this is important, why protecting the courts are important. Um, the business community, the thing is, business needs the courts to work. And, you know, we have to look at it from that perspective, too, because, you know, the best way I can get some of these legislators to move on things, if, you know, you know in North Carolina, we're looking at possibly Amazon and Apple coming in. And so, you know, we should be telling these companies, you know, do you really want to come to a state where we're, you know, you know, attacking the courts this way. You know, we had a voter ID law drop yesterday. That's the same thing. You know, we're really looking at these issues in ways to talk about and, and talk to the business communities. Because in some ways, at the end of the day, they can have the biggest impact. Judge Lewis? Ron, I, you know, it's an excellent question and a critical question. Um, the day after the presidential election last year, I sent a note to my friends and colleagues um, and it said, you get one day, one day to mourn and go through whatever you're going through right now, and then you have to start fighting. Um, you, can, you can visit here, but you cannot stay here. Um, and, and what I have seen since then, among some of my friends and among, um, but most important, among young people, is a new energy and a focus and a determination to um, to play an active role in trying to do all the things that need to be done in order to protect and maintain our democratic institutions. Millennials, to me, are the key. Um, not only because they, are, they vote, and they're going to be voting in much larger numbers, but also because they really have the most at stake here, in my judgment. And so I think that a, an ongoing outreach to um, younger people, you know, I'm always talking about passing it on and passing it on and passing it on. Many of whom are in this room and have friends who are out there just talking and engaging. Um, it's not any one particular group, but just a, a broad spectrum of, um, of, of younger people who, who see and sense that something is just wrong here, uh, is where we need to be focused. Our children um, and, and so forth. I mean, obviously there, there are the usual suspects. There's labor and there are other there are business organizations and so forth. But, um, but I really do believe that just continuing to carry the message and watching these people be and encouraging these younger people to stay engaged and stay active and vote um, is, is, uh, is really the, the key. Chris? I would just add, I mean, if the question is, who do we need to get engaged in this fight, the answer is everyone, right? I think part of the challenge for progressives, broadly speaking, is that we concede too much. We know what we don't know, and sometimes we concede too much. And I think especially when we think about judges, the courts, the law, these, these judicial opinions, we think, oh, I'm not a lawyer, maybe I can't weigh in on this, right? And there's this detachment that people don't feel the connection in a way that's very different, right? You didn't have to be a doctor to call your senator about the ACA. You didn't have to be an accountant to call your house member about tax cuts for the wealthy corporations. You don't have to be a lawyer to call your senator and oppose these nominees who have, as Christine has noted, demonstrably, ideologically extreme records, right? When Lambda Legal puts out a study that says one in three Trump nominees has, a de has demonstrated hostility toward LGBT Americans, that should give you not only pause, that should get you to pick up the phone. This is demonstrated hostility. Makes you wonder about the two thirds that probably don't think this, it. right? But just don't say it. And that's why my organization uh, called Demand Justice, we launched last month, um, demandjustice.org. Feel free to check us out. Um, we are out there engaging the progressive space. We are in this tremendous moment of citizen activism, of people realizing the power of their democracy, folks calling their senators five times a week, one of those calls has to be about judges. I don't care what you care about on your issue, whether it's civil rights, voting rights, environment, LGBT, um, reproductive justice, immigrant, or whatever it is, one of your calls has to be on judges. 
right? When we go in, when Christine and I go in and we talk to Senate offices, they talk about how the switchboards were shut down for Jeff Sessions and Betsy DeVos, and they should have been. But then we ask them, what about Neil Gorsuch? What about this extreme person that's going to sit on the highest court in the land for the rest of his life? Uncomfortable silence. And I say, well, what is that? 10, 20 calls? Right? They're like, oh, no, no, yeah, we got like 100. 100 calls? For Neil Gorsuch? Come on. We all have to be doing better. And I think that's where we, especially as lawyers, have the responsibility to tell our friends and neighbors and relatives, you don't have to be a lawyer to understand that when somebody says transgender children are proof that Satan's plan is working, that person should not be a judge. When somebody, Wendy Vitter, has been nominated for the district court, when she says, go to your doctor and ask your doctor to put forward a pamphlet that says birth control kills, that person should not be finding facts as a lifetime federal judge. Time and time again, the evidence is in. Christine mentioned this is the reason they're being nominated, and that's the reason why we have to activate ourselves. And I think we, we do ourselves a disservice when we think like, oh, who are the usual suspects? Everybody is engaging in democracy today, and every single one of those people has to understand why the courts matter. Thank you, Chris. Before, <laughs> Before we go on, I just want to remind people that I am going to take questions from the audience, fill out one of those cards, give them to one of the volunteers, and, uh, and we'll, we'll get to your questions in a second. Gina. Um, I'll let you follow up on that, but I also want to ask you about this. I think one thing that's always been vexing to me is the asymmetry between how conservatives feel about this issue and how liberals feel about this issue. In 2016, exit polls showed that for every two people who voted for Secretary Clinton because they were concerned about the future of the courts, three people voted for Donald Trump because they were <coughs> concerned about the future of the courts. Their senators seem more fired up about it. Their base is more fired up about it. What can we do to persuade our grassroots, persuade progressives around the country, persuade independents around the country that they should care about this issue as much as the conservatives do? Well, unfortunately, we haven't been doing it for the last 40 years, right, which is what the right has been doing. This has been a concerted effort and strategy on their part that they have been doing for decades. So, but just to follow up on that last question about um, communities to engage, I just want to underscore what Chris was saying about everybody and point out that we surveyed at Rethink Media, we surveyed about 45 arguably state groups who do fair courts work and judicial independence. Most of those groups are not groups of lawyers or fair courts groups. They are environmental groups. They are women's rights groups. They are racial justice and civil rights groups. Those people and those communities have to be brought in to this conversation and really talk to about how these dots are connected. As far as, and I think that's a big piece of engaging them and bringing them to the table is making those connections and building that base. And I really identifying what is at stake. If you use litigation as a key piece of your strategy to win, you've got to be concerned about the courts. You don't have a choice not to. And I think as far, insofar as we can communicate that connection to both organizational progress, movement progress, and individual impact on everyday lives, that'll be a big part of going ahead and moving forward and engaging the whole community. And Tom, from your comparative work, what groups in, in places where they have been able to stave off or reverse an erosion of democratic norms, what social groups play a big part in that? Right, so lawyers play a critical role. Uh, in the newspapers a few years ago, the lawyers of Pakistan came out to prevent the firing of the chief justice. Uh, by, a, uh, by a military dictator. Uh, in Poland last year, we saw mass public demonstrations against the packing of the constitutional court. So the public is really important. Um, I worry a little bit that we are seeing uh, the decline in public support for at least the federal courts and the Supreme Court, notwithstanding what I said about the state courts. Uh, we now have survey data showing that for the first time, the approval rating of the Supreme Court is below 50%. Uh, that's the first time since polling has occurred. Um, and it's still more popular than the president, of course, still more popular than the, than the Congress. Um, if I can, I'd like to say something about this issue of, um, of when the, um, um, uh, the, the of, of why one side is more motivated than the other. Mm -hmm. And to me, I think that's a structural issue. The fact is, as long as polling has been going on, um, far fewer people identify with the Republican Party than the Democratic Party. 
And that means, structurally, a minority party is interested in minoritarian institutions, institutions which you, know, you can be fairly safe, you'll control, uh, and will block majority preferences at times. That's the purpose of the courts. So I think it's a deep structural thing, and there are more issues that motivate voters on that side, therefore, than motivate voters on the Democratic side. Chris? Can I just add a sort of contrary point as we think about the approval rating, or maybe it's a comparative or different point, you know, to take a very unscientific poll. If I ask you, uh, do you approve or disapprove of the Supreme Court, how many people in this room would say that they approve of the Supreme Court? All right. When we think about polling, we think about it, I actually think 50% is too high. Democrats, in the fall of 2016, when asked, these are Democrats, do you approve of the Supreme Court? Two-thirds said yes. Two-thirds of Democrats approve of this Supreme Court? Yes, Obergefell was an incredibly landmark decision, but this is the Supreme Court that brought you Citizens United, that brought you Shelby County, that brought you Hobby Lobby, that brought you Heller, and you approve of this court? That's the kind of education we need if we're going to start changing this conversation, because if two-thirds of Democrats support this Supreme Court, they're never going to engage on lower courts, and they're really not going to get down to state courts. And so that's the conversation that we need to happen. And if in the context of that, we drive down this overall approval level, I would say that's actually better for the judiciary, the judiciary and what we're trying to defend than worse. All right. Um, this, in some ways, has been a depressing conversation. <laughs> but uh, I want to make it sadder if I can. Um, <laughs> So let's talk about, uh, we see all these threats, everything people have done such a wonderful job of articulating, but what's lurking around the corner that might be even worse? For example, we saw last spring the, uh, the, uh, Steve Calabresi, one of the founders of the Federal Society and some of his allies put together a plan to massively add the number of judgeships so that President Trump could uh, appoint a majority of every federal court of appeals. Uh, we, we know that some of the things Melissa's talking about, every day there's a new, new challenge. What's at stake in the 2018 elections for this issue? What's around the corner if those elections don't come out well? Christine, what are you, what are you worried about? So one thing that was in the news just this week is that uh, Chairman Grassley said what's at stake is whether he's going to move forward with a district court nominee in Wisconsin named G.M. Pietro, who has said outrageous things about the LGBT community. So his point, Grassley's point is, if Republicans still hold power, this outrageous biased nominee in Wisconsin is going to move forward and get confirmed. So he made a very clear, you know, uh, point about what will happen next in terms of district court nominees and the outrageous bias that will then infect the district court. But I think a larger uh, thing I see around the corner, uh, in addition to you know filling every vacancy and encouraging judges to go senior so that there are more, we saw that uh, happen in the Fifth Circuit uh, earlier this year by giving uh, the one a Latino judge on the Fifth Circuit in ambassador position. So then there was yet another person uh, that Trump could put on the Fifth Circuit. Uh, but what I see is I bet they're going to try and create a bunch of new courts. They will do it around the border states. They will say it's because of immigration and because we have, they're dramatically increasing, you know, the number of people they're deporting to help their deportation force. So I won't be surprised if we see a big court creation bill, like where it creates new judgeships all along the border states, and they're, you know, uh, sadly, the people who uh, hate immigrants will applaud it, and if they have enough power in the Senate, they might get it through. And so we think of court packing in the, in the sense of the president creating new seats on the Supreme Court, but it, they, I think they could do it at the lower court, too, and district court judges not, being, not just being the best job in the world, but they have an enormous amount of power. Um, and circuit court judges have enormous amount of power overseeing the immigration judges who actually serve in the Justice Department. So uh, I can see, as part of the anti-immigrant fervor on the right, uh, a court creation bill um, targeting the, the border states. Okay, that's pretty scary. Anyone want to one-up that nightmare scenario? <laughs> Yeah, or add to I it. Can. yeah, okay, Chris, good. Um, I, I can depress you more, but then hopefully uh, give you something to lift you up a little bit. My biggest concern right now is that Democrats get tired of fighting, right? There are, we know, limited things that Democrats can do, but one of the things they can do and have done 
is insist on these 30 hours of debate for every judicial nominee that goes through to make sure that as this Republican rubber stamp steamrolls through, there's at least a little bit of window for nominees to be considered. And now right now, when Mitch McConnell says, I'm canceling three weeks of the August recess, I'm worried that Democratic senators will say, oh, I had a vacation planned. I'll let you confirm 12 of these non-controversial judges so I can go home or go to campaign or do, or do events in the district. Right? And that that's going to be the thing. And this idea that there are non-controversial judges that should move through by consent is, by the way, a thing that used to, be, uh, used to be something that happened during the Bush administration, never happened once. There was never a consent package during the eight years of the Obama administration. But this idea that Democrats are starting to lose their spine. They don't want to be called obstructionists. They say, this is a non-controversial judge. I'm going to support them. To which I'd say two things. One. Even these non-controversial judges, I don't understand, this is math, why you would rush through the non-controversial judges so we can get to the controversial ones more quickly. <laughs> Two, even if you think the specific nominee is non-controversial and a number of Democratic senators have managed to find their way to negotiate with this administration and find judges that they think might be moderate, might be non-controversial, there is nothing about this process that is non-controversial from the blue slips to the hearings to disregarding the ABA to allowing people to hide things from their record to rushing them to the floor, this is not controversial. Even if you think the nominee is controversial, you have to vote no and you have to stand up for the process. This is about the institution. And if you let these Republicans bully you into going home early by confirming 10, 20, how many other judges are non-controversial, that undercuts the entire effort that we're trying to do. The good news, is that these are people who will listen to us. If we pick up the phone, if we email, if we show up in their offices and say, this is not non-controversial what they are doing to our judiciary, and I demand that you stay here in August and make them force their way through so that we do not get more of these incredibly controversial, ideological, narrow-minded extremists packing our courts. May I just right. yeah, add judge? one final point? I know Please. I I, I know we want to get to questions. I just wanted to pick up on what Chris Kane just said. He is absolutely right. Um, we, but I have better news. Um, we cannot, we must not, we will not stop fighting. Uh, and all you have to do to find just a modicum of inspiration to carry this forward and to turn this into perhaps one of our, if not the, one of our nation's finest hours, really is to look at the history of the civil rights movement in this country and the struggle for equality across the board. Anyone, and I mean anyone, who doesn't understand how to fight, just remember the legacy of Nelson Mandela in South Africa. Remember the legacy of Dr. King. Remember the legacy of all of those who have fought to preserve our ideals and to further our, our effort toward equality in this country. That is what is on the line. The only question is how we fight and when we choose to fight. And Chris has identified some areas where we really need to put a lot of emphasis, but the idea that Democrats or anyone is not going to stand up and own your patriotism, own your commitment to equality in this country and to the ideals that people have died for throughout history and that, we are, that are really on the line in this next election is absolutely unacceptable and must be unacceptable to everyone in this room and everyone that we can reach out to. Uh, thank you. That uh, very inspiring and powerful. I want to get to some of your questions now. I've looked through them. There's some excellent questions here. None of them seem to be about Chris Rock's recent Netflix special, <laughs> but, uh, but, but maybe, maybe there's stuff here the panel can answer. And Melissa, I think the first one's for you. Um, and, uh, you know, why do you think your work in North Carolina was successful when the efforts many of us launched to get Judge Garland a hearing were not successful. What have you learned that the rest of us should learn? What works at the grassroots level that maybe we missed here in this Garland fight? 
Well, in North Carolina, uh, we operate um, under the uh, shaker-baker method. Um, this comes from the civil rights uh, terminology of tree shakers and jelly makers. So we operate where we, um, we do include everybody. We, we have people who are set aside who are shakers, who are meant to rally and to, to do the education. Then we have the bakers who are, thus, who are those of us who are in the inside of the legislature kind of do, doing the wheeling and dealing. And so we're trying to use every tool in our toolbox to get the message out, to get the education out. We are bringing in unlikely allies like faith community members, um, and we're going to the grassroots. You know, we're not we're not staying. You know, in the Raleigh Durham area, we are going out across the community, across the state. You know, uh, like I said, we've done over 30 events across the state. When you go into these small communities and you put on one of these town halls, it ends up in the local paper, and then everybody in the town reads about it, and then you start spreading the word, and and then it's about it's about connecting the issues because we all have issues that we care about. I'm a mother of three children. I very much care about public education in North Carolina. So it's, it's a way of connecting the issues that individuals care about back to the courts. In North Carolina, we've seen the courts have to overturn 14 or 50 unconstitutional laws by our, our General Assembly that have to do with environmental issues, women's rights issues, voting rights issues. And so we're going to people and saying, you know, these are the issues you care about. Here's how they connect to the courts. Come join our fight. It's great. Gina? May I would just add that with the, with the Gorsuch fight, I mean, I work as a democracy collaborative, so we focus on fair courts, judicial independence, money in politics, and voting rights. Going into the Gorsuch fight, the math was not there for us to win that fight. But we went in with the goal of making, at least our community, money in politics community, making that a central issue because we knew Neil Gorsuch was time and time again had indicated that he would side on behalf of moneyed interest, corporate interest, and special interest against regular people. And so we actually did that during that fight. We made that a cornerstone issue. We made that something he was called to the carpet for. But that was really, in many ways, the totality of what we could do in that situation. And so, Gina, uh, my next question actually uh, follows up on that and uh, I think is best addressed to you, which is, uh, of all the arguments out there, what do you think are the best public arguments on why courts matter? If you, are, you have a chance, you're on TV, you got 30 seconds, 40 seconds, what's the best argument to make to reach a broad uh, audience of lay people about why the courts matter? People understand the role the court should play, and they just innately get that everyone should have their rights protected Everyone should be able to have a fair day in court, and everyone should be able to have that confidence going in, in their system, in their democracy, and in the government. I think that we really need to underscore the role that courts play in people's lives, to Melissa's point about engaging all of these communities, when we do that and say, this is why they matter to you. This is why they matter to your child's public education. This is why they matter to the clean water. This is why they matter to civil rights. That's the way we win. Um, Chris, um, you know, I'm going to ask you the question that's in the cards like three times that I get all the time, which is, uh, gives you a chance to defend your old line of work here. Uh, you know, is Trump really packing the courts or did Obama just not care enough, didn't do enough to fill the courts, didn't do his job, didn't take it seriously, didn't nominate people, didn't make it a priority? Uh, how much of this is our fault? So, um having spent uh, a lot of time defending the Obama administration while I was in it, um, I, I, think that it's, I think it's a fair criticism that we were slow in the beginning uh, because as progressives are wont to do, we focused a lot on legislation. We focused a lot on executive action. Uh, we actually did also have two Supreme Court vacancies that had not been uh, open for a year, so we had a little bit of vetting and planning that we had to do that went into that. But I will say that by the end of 2014, we had caught up, right? The, the slowness and the delay of the first term, by 2013-14, working with Lita Reid, working with Senate Democrats, we confirmed the most judges in two-year period in more than 20 years, right? So finally, we caught up the real problem then was when we lost power and Republicans, again, only confirmed 22 judges in the last two years and left these seats open. So that's the defense of the Obama administration. I think it's a reasonable-ish one. Uh, but the reality, too, 
is that we're all at fault because there's not enough political will and there's not enough political impetus for the Obama administration to do anything else. While we were passing bill after bill after bill supported by all of these different areas, nobody was saying also confirm these judges, right? And that's on us and that is the conversation that has to change. As much as we're gonna try to fight these Trump nominees now and try to slow them down, the bigger question about whether or not we're gonna be successful and how we're gonna defend our courts is the next time there's a Democratic president, the next time there's a Democratic Senate, I wanna see 21 of her or his circuit court judges confirmed by June 8th of their second year. And that's how we're gonna win. Yeah. <laughs> So, Christine, another question that's in the, and from the audience several times that I also get quite often is, uh, what happens when the shoe is back on the other, other foot? Uh, and by that I mean the day will come, hopefully soon, when different people run the Senate, <laughs> different people run the White House. Which of these rules that the Republicans have stripped away should we put back? Should the blue SIP rule come back if, we, if progressives have the chance to do that? Should the 60 vote hurdle come back? How do you think about the happy day when uh, people we like are in, uh, they have the ability to make these decisions? <laughs> I think before we can get to the happy day, we have to add to Gina's point, which is the why courts matter is a really important message. But I think the vast majority of people don't know that the Senate plays any role. So I will just emphasize to everyone in this room, part of the education effort needs to be that this president alone doesn't appoint judges. Right? I do think that most people don't understand that the Senate is supposed to be an independent check on the president in a lot of areas, but especially it's specifically designated to be a check in this area and judges. So I would just urge folks who are working on their messaging and their talking points for, for social gatherings and when you go back to your legal communities, the Senate is where the fight is right now. And to Chris's point, we expect progressive senators and moderate ones to care about the rule of law and the threats that are here. So I think part of it is getting people to care. But I have trouble seeing past these dark days. Maybe it's just that there is uh, so much fire incoming right now in the civil rights uh, space. But I think it's gonna depend a lot on who has the gavel, frankly, and generationally, who has the gavel in the Senate. I do think that older senators, the <coughs> senators who've been around longer, you know, re have nostalgia about how it used to work, right? And the blue slip was a really important power for making senators <coughs> have power in their states to be meaningfully consulted, not just notified, who's going to get nominated in their communities. So I think a lot of that might depend on where we are in terms of who has the gavel next in the Senate Judiciary Committee. Um, because I think that, that senators who served longer think back in a very gauzy way about how things <coughs> worked, right? Uh, but I think, the, I think it all depends on whether if Democrats take back the Senate, they have 50 or 51, or if they have 60. Because I think that is a, just the hugest difference. Right now, there is still a filibuster that still requires 60 senators to pass the legislation. I think that's going to stay, by the way, because that's the only way Mitch McConnell can blame Democrats for everything uh, that his base demands of him that he actually doesn't want to pass. But the, it doesn't work that way on judges. So I can imagine that it will have a lot to do, not just with who has um, 50 or 51, but what, how big that margin is. Because there are many senators in the middle in the Democratic Party who would not go for the scorched earth uh, tactics, frankly, that Republicans that Mitch McConnell will do. And so I think putting back some of these safeguards will depend a lot on the number and the election and, and how big the power is. I think blue slips do play a role, but I don't think they're a civil rights tool by any means. Blue slips were used by people to keep people of color out of very important seats exactly. throughout the country. So <laughs> I don't want anyone to think that uh, the blue slip is the savior. I, I certainly don't think it is from a civil rights perspective. It is not from a diversity perspective. But we did see the, the blue slip used to encourage diversity. It just depended on the priority of that particular senator. So I just want to say that the blue slip right now is an important constraint and it's certainly a power uh, issue for the Senate, 
But if it goes away, I don't think that's what erodes civil rights. What erodes civil rights is the president picking nominees because of their record for bias. May Just, I, if, yeah, if yeah I, can I uh, throw a question at you uh, to answer in part of what, what, with what you're going to say also, which is um, when, when we try to engage the public on this issue and have a public dialogue about defending the third branch, how do you as a former judge talk about what the role of judges is in our country? And the, the image that Chief Justice Roberts likes to use of, oh, they're just all neutral, balls and strikes, ideology doesn't matter. Uh, what role does that play in, in this debate? And what's the alternative to that when you explain to people, hey, I used to be a judge. This is why who the judges are really matter. Well, I'll answer by picking up on the last point that Christine just made about the blue slip. You know, and then I'll get to, to your, you know, directly to your question. The blue slip, as we know it today, was actually um, implemented by um, Senator Eastland in 1956 to try to keep black folk off the court and to try to uh, stop the court and courts in the South, in particular, with racist judges. And so, it is not uh, necessarily the feature of you know the saving feature that we might want to think of it of it as. And <clears throat> I guess my my. I will answer your question directly. What I tell people and what I hope I will always be able to say to people is that an independent judiciary is an ideal that must be preserved to protect the interests of, uh, um, of the, the least popular interests first and foremost and, and our constitutional rights and, and, um, uh, uh, at, at all costs. But that's sort of an academic, you know, law school kind of typical or off the cuff kind of answer. Really what we do is we come together and we grapple with a problem and through corporate decision making on the court that I served on, the Third Circuit, invite different views to try to fashion the right remedy or result in a particular case. And the ideal there is to take advantage, as my friend Judge McKee was talking about yesterday, and learn from our colleagues who may have a different ideology, bring that to the fore to help further advance the law and, the, and the, um, uh, our understanding of, of, of um, uh, the best way for civil rights and, and uh, workers' rights and all of the rights that are so important to us um, to, to foster and to develop. So, I mean, I, I just think that courts are, if we get the public to understand that an independent judiciary is ideally not beholden to a legislature, not beholden to an executive, and is there as a bulwark to protect those kinds of interests, that uh, that's not that complicated, and it's something that maybe will help um, invoke um, a, a deeper interest and, and a further desire to protect. But what I also want to point out is that um, you know, this, this idea of um, what to do when the shoe is on the other foot, I mean, my question to Chris and to you, Christine, and, and to you, Ron, also, I guess you're the moderator here, but you've worked, on, you've worked behind the scenes for so many years, too. Would you do, in reaction to what happened to Merrick Garland, would you do the same thing if the situation were reversed? I mean, have we reached a point where we have to fight the same way? Do we have to um, subjugate, as I mentioned earlier, our values and principles and appreciation for these norms and for our institutions in order to win and to continue to win? And, you know, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I don't know what I think we ought to do under those circumstances. I, what, what do you think? Would you do it? Would you recommend doing it? Would you recommend to the chairman of the Judiciary Committee or the leader of the Senate, a Democrat, with a Republican nominee with two years, a year and a half left, that, well, you guys did it, let's do it? Is that where we are? So I personally don't believe that presidents only have powers to nominate Supreme Court nominees in odd-numbered years. I don't think that that makes sense. I agree with right? you 100 percent. However, let me have an important caveat. I think it depends on what's happening uh, at that moment. If this president is under current indictment or currently under impeachment, should he be able to appoint a Supreme Court nominee? I think that's an open question. That's very Agreed. different than the situation with Merrick Garland. Right. right? But so, if we had the situation with Merrick Garland in reverse, a, 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 a moderate nominee, acceptable to both sides, clearly qualified, nominated by a president with a year and a half left or a year left, um, 
would, would you, are we there now? It, While well, you guys did it, so now that we have the power and we have the gavel, as you put it, we're gonna do it. I mean, I do think that that is the challenge, and I don't think that standing up for our judiciary and using some of these same tactics, I would argue is not subjugating our values, it's standing up for them. Right? The way, what I do think is different is I would not say that Democrats, if they were to be in power in the next Congress, should flatly deny President Trump's nominee even a hearing. But I will say what President Trump has given us is a list of the 25 people he's going to choose from. Right. He's, there's not a single moderate on that there's list. No you get on that right. list because the Federalist Society put you there, because he, right. they passed the, the litmus test to overturn Roe versus Wade, they passed the litmus test on right. Heller, they have I, demonstrated I, records, and that is the basis on which I think that the they easy, should oppose so the That's I, the easy I, way out. I, no, so wait, wait, wait. So this, this, this is not a court, this is a panel. I get to ask okay, the you're right, sorry about that. <laughs> My apologies, you're absolutely no, no, right. No, 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 <laughs> I'm sorry, no, I apologize, and, um, I do. No, no, no I, I forgot, I forgot. But just, you know, like, just, just a little bit of institutional role sorting out we need to do here. Um, professor, I want to ask you, several people in the cards have asked about um, kind of democracy in the courts, elected judges, retention elections, a lot of these things that to people who are more involved in the federal judicial issues, we've always been told these are like kind of bad things, things we're very nervous about, you know, people voting up and down on judges, that's not really our Article Three vision of the world. How do you see these kinds of direct democratic involvement in judicial uh, selection, retention, removal, how do you see all that uh, as part of either eroding or protecting the rule of law? If you were going to give advice to a state rewriting its constitution, what would you tell them is the right way to pick judges and what would you, what would you be concerned about? Right. So um, one of the nice things about the United States is we've got 50 different states, so we have some comparative leverage to kind of answer that question. I will say we're the only country, or until recently, we're the only country with judicial elections. Now we're seeing a um, little bit of a trend in comparative constitutional design of electing Supreme Court justices, so moving in that direction. You know, the academic literature on it is pretty uh, mixed. Um, it, generally speaking, doesn't seem to make that much of a difference for decision making, except on one major issue, which of course is the death penalty. Uh, and the judges who are up for re-election tend to be much, much more punitive. Uh, and that is something, of course, to be concerned with. My own view is uh, I like these mixed councils for nominating, uh, and I like reten retention elections are fine. That seems like a way of getting the people a bite at the apple. There's some um, ability uh, for the judge to be accountable, uh, but for initial appointment, um, I prefer uh, nonpartisan uh, judges and um, you know, only use elections for retec retention. But it's just a preference, it's a matter of abstract institutional design. And um, you know, uh, on Tuesday, a uh, state court judge in California was defeated in his retention election uh, because he had given a very light sentence in a case of sexual assault at Stanford uh, University. Um, should we be, if we care about defending the independence of the judiciary, should we be applauding his non-retention or worried about his non-retention? And how does that all sort out in this issue? We want to bite on that one? Yeah, Tom? I, I, I think it's acceptable. I mean, uh, uh, you do need some, uh, judges have a tremendous amount of power in our country. Uh, with power comes some need for some accountability. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, in, in an era of hashtag me too, uh, having given that light sentence is something the public has, I think, a legitimate right to, to be concerned with. Um, uh, I, I suppose it depends contextually on what are the reasons for which people are being uh, removed and what, what is the reasons for which the accountability is occurring. I, I, I applaud it. I think that <clears throat> for far too long, uh, male judges have not understood the, the real lived experiences of victims. And I think that that ruling really showed um, not appreciating what it felt like to be a woman who was raped on, on, on campus. We have a current pending nominee, Ryan Bounds, who got a vote yesterday, who also at Stanford, when he was a student there, said outrageous things about sexual assault victims and why would it matter to them if their, if their rapist was in class with them. I mean, so it was a really interesting thing for him to get a vote the very same week this judge was recalled. Also, he, he said this when he was at Stanford. So I was surprised that didn't get a little bit more lift given how many people care about 
campus sexual assault? Gina? I think it's a slippery slope. I mean, yeah. I've, I've been trying to um, actually not have this conversation with people because <laughs> I, <laughs> I agree with Christine that yeah. that was an insensitive and an incorrect decision that Judge Persky made in that case. But electing judges and having this ability to remove them from office and, and and a time when the public we know doesn't actually understand what's necessary of a judge and doesn't understand all of all that we know about the judiciary and how courts work i think that it's it is a slipper it's just a slippery slope and i think that we you know a lot of groups and civil rights groups are really concerned about what happens when we elect judges and what those elections look like and what big money elections look like when you've got big money in elections and what when we have public financing of elections how that changes the game it's a lot to consider, and what we know from recent research is that Americans really like their elections. And so in states that are, particularly in state courts where we have this ability to reform how judges are selected, that's something that we have to consider. What does it look like to select them? Is there, in South Carolina, the legislature is a key part of that process. In other states, it's partisan elections and nonpartisan elections, and so I think there is a need to sort of have um, to make sure that there's accountability, voters like accountability, and I think that's what comes into play here. But also, we have an expectation of how judges serve, and I think that the voters don't always understand exactly what's at play. Melissa, you wanna add some there? So we've been having this debate in North Carolina for the past year, because we've been contemplating uh, different selection methods of judges. Um, like I said, uh, the current model in North Carolina is partisan uh, judicial elections. It used to be nonpartisan uh, elections with judicial public financing for our statewide judges. Um, and so proposals have come up um, that were called by the legislature merit selection, but they were not merit selection. What they really were was the legislative appointment of judges. So when this conversation happens, we cannot allow this kind of uh, you know, cl a cloak of, uh, you know, when something's really legislative appointment, but, you know, call it merit selection. So we should, um, you know, really be looking at these type of issues. Um, I know in North Carolina, um, three out of four North Carolinians support the election of judges. So, uh, and that's a barrier we would have to get across with the constitutional amendment. So, you know, that future for a constitutional amendment and moving to a different selection um, doesn't look likely. Great. Um, we're getting uh, near the end. I have a few more questions here from the audience. Uh, one that is on several cards is uh, speculation about the possibility that we get to the end of June and we see a vacancy on the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, what do you think will happen if that happens? What do you think people should do if that happens? How should progressives think about that and think about the fight that would come? And Chris. You guys at Demand Justice would be at the center of that. What do you, why don't you kick us off? Yeah, so we have, as I mentioned before, as we all know, the Federal Society has provided a list to President Trump that he's declared he's going to choose from. So we know who the potential candidates are. We've known some of these names for almost two years. And so I think that if there's a vacancy, I think Democratic senators should write out of the box say, this list is unacceptable for these reasons. And talk about, we know the records of these people. Some of them just came through the Senate within the last year, and we know. So it's not the knee-jerk, we'll oppose anybody. But we're gonna oppose these people. And I think that's the starting place to try to get us to where we might be or should be uh, in terms of more consensus or potential consensus nominees. Christine? I completely agree with that because this list shows they're not independent. They earned a spot on this list and this list has been held out and campaigned on, which to me makes me just very uncomfortable. We know they pass multiple um, ideological tests, but this list has people, you know, as young as 37 years old, uh, Wyrick from Oklahoma, who just had his hearing, and the list is, is really a very scary document in terms of what they're trying to do. I think a lot can be done to educate people about what it takes to earn a spot on this list, but what we all need to be pushing for is someone who would be moderate and independent. Being on this list shows that you are not. I disagree uh, only slightly. Um, I happen to know one of the individuals who is on the list, and um, I know that person fairly well, and I know that that person is not as has been portrayed by um, certain groups and in the media and so forth. I know that there are some others on that list who would be completely unacceptable to me and um, I would not want to see on the court. Um, 
I, as, I guess as you get, I, I'm somewhat an institutionalist in, in my regard and respect for, um, um, for the um, um, orderly process of, of, and the values that are at stake in seeing that furthered um, compel me to, well, first of all, I hope that there is not a vacancy, but should there be one, um, you know, I, I would hope the Senate would perform its traditional function of advice and consent and not do a Merrick Garland. We're not going to, you know, we're not going to have a hearing even if, if, if the Democrats were to take the Senate. Um, but um, let's just hope that we don't have to get to that point. I, 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 I'm a one who has been trying to pool money to, to pay Ruth Bader Ginsburg's uh, coach or whatever the exercise. <laughs> and I said, let's try to keep that going, keep her in shape. Yeah, I should say, by the way, at this panel on defending the third branch, we're very lucky to have several members of the judiciary in the room. Uh, if you're sitting next to one, give them a big hug and encourage them to continue their important work in their current jobs for as long as possible. You know, one thing we really haven't talked enough about, uh, it's a broad topic, but, um, you know, we've, we've talked about uh, the conservatism of the judges that President Trump has nominated, a lot of changes in the process. But, of course, we, we haven't really had a chance to talk about the complete lack of diversity in the judges that President Trump has, has, um, has, has nominated and appointed. So what can we do to highlight that as an issue how does that fit into this discussion about uh, the judiciary? And, uh, and what can we do to kind of get the public a little more aware and engaged on this, this point, which seems to be kind of just flashing, flashing by? Thoughts on that? The NAACP Legal Defense Fund has this great graphic that has gone around Twitter that shows the people blocked, and then blocked, meaning Obama nominees of color who are blocked, and then who replaced them. And it is a really stunning visual when you see it just in the, you know, in the way that they've done it. I think we need to be talking about this. I think we need to be talking broadly about what this president is trying to do to the courts, but that includes the whitening of the courts and why that is the wrong direction for a more and more diverse country. Institutions need to reflect the people they serve. And there is no reason we should shy away from saying that. And what this president is doing is in the opposite direction. Well, I would just say that I, I think we have to be unapologetic and we need to call it for what it is, right? When this president has nominated more nominees who the ABA has found not qualified than African-American nominees, this is part of his white supremacy agenda. And I think we've got to call that out and lift that up. And I would just add that the research I've seen most recently really points to the fact that Americans want diverse courts too. We want courts that look like our communities. We want judges who've lived experience that look like our neighbors and look like ours. We want judges who have had a diversity of I mean, it's not just race and gender, it's sexual orientation, it's economic, it's a whole range of diversity. And diversity looks different to different people, but we all need to speak to all of those pieces. If I, can I just yes. say uh, on the diversity of the courts, Judge Reeves from Mississippi, a district court judge I see you sitting right over there, just issued an order. I'm sure some of you have seen it. Uh, I think it was last week, Judge, wasn't it? Um, in, in connection with the appointment of a receiver that traces the history of diversity, of the, the lack of diversity of the federal courts in particular, and why it is so important in the selection of this particular position to focus on diversity. But it, it, of course this is an agenda to further a white supremacist approach to thing, and, and to fill the bench with an ideological perspective that is anathema to those of us who recognize and appreciate the meaning of diversity and why it matters, why it's so important to this nation, why it reflects this nation, pluralism, what it means, what it's about. But um, right now we have what we have and we have to make every effort to try to see to it that that does not continue. I don't, so I agree with you, Chris. Yeah. Uh, I'm getting the red sign that we're starting to get near the end. So I want to give everyone one uh, final question here before we uh, close. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, I think it's been a great discussion, great conversation. If we were going to give the people in this room one thing they could take away to do to defend the third branch, one piece of advice, one action item, 
what would that be? And Tom, I'm going to start with you and just come back down this way. Uh, well, I think there's obviously you have to get out and vote and call your senators and such. I also think we need to be thinking about a grand bargain for what we would want the branch to look like 10, 20 years from now and how to get there, how to undo some of these things in a strategic and concerted way that might actually get agreement uh, down the road. I think that's the critical issue. Okay. Judge Lewis? Write, speak, teach your children well. It's a wonderful song by Crosby Sosen passed from a long time ago. Um, but seriously, uh, reach out. Um, talk around your communities, uh, focus on what's happening here in Washington and in your home states and cities, do everything you can to advocate for the fundamental principles that make this nation so great. Don't ever take a, a step backwards in that, in that effort. So I would say voting is the single most important thing you can do and, and letting people know why you're voting, that this is one of your top issues. But the, I am a Senate person by upbringing and so what I would say is people in this room need to be putting much more pressure on senators on both sides of the aisle uh, to, to reject judges and judicial nominees that have clear bias. There is no reason they can just say, well, we can't stop them anyway, we shouldn't fight. That is plain out of touch with what we are asking them to do. But if we in this room who care about this issue don't stand up right now, and not just in November, but don't stand up right now and require that of people who care about the rule of law, of people who care about our courts, then, then we really don't care about this issue. The fight is on right now. And Republicans in the Senate are assessing whether Democrats are going to roll over and do consent packages right now. And so if people in this room don't go back home and activate people in their communities, then we will lose, not just this summer, but we will lose the courts for 40 years to come because these fights are for life. And they are nominating 30 and 40 year olds to take over this court. Uh, thank you, Christine. Chris? So uh, this may sound self-serving uh, because it is. Uh, you should go to our website, I knew you were demandjustice.org, <laughs> and after you put in your name and email and phone number, standard text messaging rates will apply, scroll down just a little bit more, and there is this amazing one-minute video that our digital team has put together, uh, which is, explains why the court should matter, right? Because we have a hard time explaining this. We talk about like the 30 second, 40 second. One minute, I've been in this space, in this fight for 15 years, I have never seen something so powerful, something so clear, something so easy to share with people I know who don't understand why courts matter. I watched it 10 times the first time I saw it. We have a fantastic digital team, happen to be all women, which I'm very excited for the next Take My Daughter to Work Day. Um, the, that's the kind of work they're doing, but then, after you've signed up on our website, go to our Twitter page, uh, and the reason for that is because we're currently running an ad campaign to oppose the nomination of Thomas Farr for the Eastern District of North Carolina, and all of these themes run together. President Obama nominated two African-American women for this seat that has never had an African-American, even though a third of that district is African-American, and instead, President Trump has put forward Thomas Farr, who has been the drafter and defender of North Carolina's law that, as you probably know, has surgically targeted African Americans with almost surgical precision. We're mounting this fight. He's the next judge up to receive a floor, a floor vote. Check out our web page, check out our Twitter feed, 30 second video, handy number to call. Our Twitter handle is We Demand Justice. The website's demandjustice.org. We demand justice because it's going to take all of us. We have to stand up for our rights, for our values, and for judges who are going to protect the quality and justice for all. Gina? Yeah, I think I deserve some applause too. <laughs> Krista said it has to be all of us. One thing, bring more friends to this fight. Bring, I know that ACS is not the only community that has your heart. I know that people in this room care about other issues and are in other communities. Bring them to this. Um, you're the best messenger to bring those people to that. And then when you bring them to this fight and when you fight, I'm going to come at this from a media and communications perspective, and when you're perhaps writing an op-ed, thank you, Melissa, thank you, Judge Lewis, when you are on TV, when you're on the radio, frame a choice. That's how we win people. It has not to be just not Trump and not Trump's nominees and not his agenda, but it has to be our agenda. Our agenda for a vision of courts that protect us all, protect all of our rights. 
When we do that, we win. Awesome. Yeah. Organize. Go back home to your states. Go back home to your ACS chapters. Work through them. When, when things hit the fan in North Carolina, I call my ACS chapters to help get the word out. And they do calling campaigns. They, they, they do a lot of the grunt work to get this done. Please continue to do that because it is our job as citizens in a democracy to protect the institutions of our democracy. And we must continue to fight to protect our courts. Great, thank you. Uh, a few, just a few quick closing thoughts. Uh, Justice Kennedy, if you're listening, uh, <laughs> Donald Trump's going to name Jeannie Pirro from Fox TV to the Supreme Court if you resign. So right. just want you to keep that in mind. Um, I want to, uh, I want to uh, thank this panel for their excellent comments, their excellent uh, advice and uh, guidance here today. Uh, I think it's been really interesting and engaging. Uh, I think if you're interested, by the way, a little self, shameless self-promotion, if you're interested in taking this fight to other people and you uh, listen to Pod Save America, uh, their new episode is, uh, is about judicial selection. They have a very special guest on talking about it, so, uh, so be sure to tune in and download uh, on that. Uh, 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 immediately after this session, breakout sessions begin. Please consult your program for more details Volunteers will be on site to help direct you. Why don't you then finally join me one more time in thanking the panel uh, for kicking us off today with this group.